Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of The Surge. So for today I'd like to talk about uh, a topic that I think is eventually going to become controversial if it isn't already many hospitals. And that's the idea of uh, happy hypoxemics and how to manage them, how to deal with them. So I have no issues with people avoiding intubation if they can. And I have no issues with people with a fairly high level of uh, clinical acumen, uh, experience, uh, sort of interpreting the literature in their own way and, and, and making uh, decisions that they will be held responsible for ultimately ethically and legally. Uh, for that particular set, you know, we all have our certain preferences in terms of management. Uh, I do have an issue when the term happy hypoxemic is used like it's something that's novel and when people dedicate all the time to making it sound like it's a direct association or correlation with COVID and they don't understand that, that happy hypoxemia has always been part of respiratory physiology and pathology. Even I as a surgeon or somebody with a strong surgical background who's an intensivist uh, was trained, we understood and we, we saw this on a daily basis. You know, what you call a happy hypoxemic happens after every major surgery. They're all happy hypoxemics. And I, I really do think that part of the reason why people find this very unique is because uh, they've been looking at it uh, from a different perspective. Uh, many of us uh, have grown our skill set in the acute situation, in the emergency department, and uh, we, uh, we've developed a, a very strong, robust understanding uh, of certain parts of respiratory medicine and physiology that help us the most in the acute situation, and myself included. My, my weakest point is, in fact, internal medicine. Uh, I can't control blood sugar. Uh, I can't do a, a, a bradycardia workup for a stable patient. I don't know what thyroid disease is uh, in terms of medications, etc. cetera, but um, I can fix a patient if you need me to uh, if uh, they have a pH of 6.9, and you're not sure why, right? We all have our own strengths and weaknesses coming from our backgrounds. But it disturbs me when I see this, and I, I'm not picking out one person. I'm just saying this is what I see on a regular basis in many forums. Uh, people making up numbers like an 80% mortality from using a mechanical ventilator and using the excuse of the hypo happy hypoxemic to try and justify that. So there's happy hypoxemics, and then there are people who will die because you delayed their intubation for way too long. And it's, it's very bad when that happens. And as you can see from the comment that was made, people find it terrifying. Your peers will find it terrifying when somebody's breathing at a rate of 50 and you're calling them a happy hypoxemic. A rate of 50 will make nobody happy. And I think that part of the reason is because we have used this curve uh, forever uh, to help us understand uh, how hemoglobin, oxygen carrying capacity, uh, pH, uh, 2, 3 dBG, temperature, um, O2 content, CO2 content, uh, affect partial pressure of oxygen and its correlation with hemoglobin. My problem is that in COVID, what we're seeing is that these two factors, oxyhemoglobin saturation, PO2, don't seem to correlate. So I keep hearing about happy hypoxemics, but what people are looking at are, is a saturation. And what people are quoting in all the online forums, all those non-peer-reviewed papers, is saturation. Nobody's giving you a partial pressure of oxygen, right? Nobody tells me that the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 and the patient's happy with a normal pH. Nobody ever says that. Everybody tells me their SAT is 70. So what that tells me is that for some reason, it could be lung water, it could be inflammatory, it could be metabolic at the hemoglobin level, it could be just the way that the detector for the spectra unit works, for some reason, we're getting a PO2 of 60 with a SAT of 70. We're getting a PO2 of 70 with a SAT of, uh, sorry, PO2 of 70 with a SAT of uh, 85 or 80, right? We're getting numbers that don't necessarily make us okay or make us feel happy about the situation. And again, we see that a little bit in surgery. In effect, we've never been taught it this way, but this is what oxygen content of blood looks like in a very simple way. The hemoglobin is how big your, your bucket is, okay? Uh, the saturation is the percentage of the bucket that's filled. The PO2 is how much uh, water the bucket actually has in it, okay? So 
in COVID, what, what I think people are calling a happy hypoxemic is somebody who has a lot of water in it. But for some reason, the technology that we're using to provide us with dynamic data in most emergency departments and most ICUs, the, the, um, the saturation probe, is not detecting it for some reason. That's what it feels like. And I'm just making this shit up, but that's what it feels like. And whenever we have that, our, our gut reaction is to talk about how we're going to fill the bucket better. And so we become obsessed with oxygenation and ventilation, gas delivery and overcoming poor lung mechanics. Well, in happy hypoxemics, from the descriptions that I'm getting and from what I'm seeing, and I work with a lot of COVID patients, what happy hypoxemics look like to me are patients with normal dead space, normal lung mechanics, and some diffusion problem. We call that post-op atelectasis. So as far as I'm concerned, happy hypoxemics in COVID are basically a post-op right hemicolectomy with a set of 82 sometime during the night with no tachycardia and no increased effort of breathing. That's what we call post-op atelectasis. And the way that we treat it is pretty much the same way that's being advocated for these uh, quote-unquote early happy hypoxemic COVIDs. And, you know, it, it stands to reason because they're almost the same. So what we tend to do is we will uh, give them a center spirometers. What, what we call awake proning in COVID is probably closer to just making them walk around and get some exercise with physiotherapy. I don't think that we've ever tried awake proning on atelectasis. Maybe we should. I would suspect that in COVID, because the primary driver is inflammatory, somebody's going to come up with a paper that says that low-dose steroids, like baby hydrocort or something crazy like that, something that sounds like um, a pulmonary uh, pneumonia dosing protocol uh, will be advocated for, and frequent monitoring, which, by the way, is another problem. So if you're going to have a happy hypoxemic, you're going to need to be able to round on them. And with the nursing ratios that we have right now all around the world, I'm not picking anybody up. It's not one specific person or one specific center in general. The nursing ratios that we have, we can't provide that frequent monitoring to find out when they're unhappy. Another concern that I have is, and I'm starting to see this in some EDs and in some ICUs. So I work in a fictional referral center for COVID patients. Uh, it's not really fictional, but let's just say it is fictional, right? And what I'm seeing is I'm getting patients come in with fentanyl patches on them who were tachypnic, were given a fentanyl patch and prone. And I was told that that makes them happy hypoxemics. You can't convert a happy hypoxemic into an unha un unhappy one without something going wrong. So if somebody came in fine with a low saturation and now they're breathing at a rate of 50 with a low saturation, they have a CO2 washout problem in addition to their low saturation. If somebody comes in with a, a low saturation and they're breathing at a rate of 50, slapping a fentanyl patch on them to reduce their drive to breathe is going to kill them. It's going to raise their CO2 in addition to uh, leading to increased metabolic demand uh, on the anaerobic threshold. So I, I wouldn't recommend sedating people into that or giving people presidics to get them there, right? And I wouldn't recommend avoiding ventilators. And the reason why is ventilators are not the cause of the mortality. The need for ventilation reflects increased work of breathing, a CO2 dead space problem, or your body reaching the metabolic threshold, where you go from aerobic to anaerobic or vice versa, and acidemia occurs. Your strategy is just not working if you have an increased work of breathing, a CO2 problem, or a metabolic threshold problem. If your problem is just a SAT with a normal respiratory rate, normal drive to breathe, different issue, right? Metabolic demand can only be measured using pH lactate based deficit, just like you would in a trauma, maybe potentially hypercarbia. Increased work of breathing, you know, there are different scoring systems. We tend to eyeball it in my center, but you can use the Cabrini uh, respiratory strain store. It works, right? I, I'm not going to de deny it, but I don't think that it reflects our reality with COVID because our patients are very dynamic. They go from being very tachypnic one second to being normal the other and vice versa. And an insurmountable CO2. So what I call is an upward trend of CO2 that has reached a point where you're starting to affect the pH. When I'm there, uh, I, I decide to intubate. And that's how I would explain the mortality. And remember, in the original Chinese data, 
that was considered unrealistic, etc., but is now seeming more and more to reflect the reality all around the world, you know, steroids did have a role early on. They did have what they described as happy hypoxemics, but they also said that avoiding intubation in somebody who needs it because of an increased CO2, increased work of breathing demand, or resistant hypoxemia is what they called it. So resistant PO2 that is not getting better, you should probably intubate. So unhappy hypoxemics should be intubated. So if your breathing rate is in the 40s, if you have a high drive to breathe and rising lactate and rising CO2, in my opinion, you should intubate these patients. But the other problem that I have is that whenever somebody intubates them, they don't recognize the difference between ARDSnet, which is designed for ARDS, and stabilizing an acute patient. And that shows another limitation of our practice as intensivists from different backgrounds. So internal medicine slash general surgery, uh, no acute care background uh, intensivists will automatically jump headfirst into ARDSnet, right? Because that's what they're used to dealing with. People who work in the emergency room know ARDSnet is great. Once you've stabilized the patient, you've washed out their CO2, and you have an understanding of the patient's dynamics, and they're fully relaxed, they're fully sedated, maybe even paralyzed. That's when you can transition to ARDSnet. ARDSnet is not going to be your acute management as your patient crashes, right? That's not going to be the way that you do it. You may not even use, you may go for even, I would say, a volume-controlled mode at some point, and then switch it back. So something like PRVC, which is pressure-regulated volume control, and then switch it back because you want to guarantee a minute ventilation while you have 10 other patients around you. You might have to do voodoo things like that. I've seen people do it. I don't personally do it. I've heard of people doing it. I have two or three uh, intensivists that swear by volume control um, that are very good friends of mine. I, I'm personally a very big fan of pressure control, and I don't mind spending the extra hour at the bedside every day uh, divided up between patients just to be able to get that extra feeling for the respiratory dynamics that I have to deal with. You need to be able to maximize ventilation and oxygenation, and they're not the same thing. They're not the same thing, right? And you might, you might probably need to be able to overcome a metabolic acidosis because this patient's been running themselves crazy, and you might have to bump up your rate. Your minute ventilation will definitely have to be maximized because by the time you intubate them, if they're breathing at 40, their minute ventilation is through the roof to the point of inefficiency. Another thing that you need to understand when you're deciding to intubate is that not only is the PO2 versus saturation inaccurate, and not only is the hemoglobin part and parcel of how well you might detect these things, and that's why I think that it's, it's probably a, a lung edema, hemoglobin, atelectasis problem. There's probably something there that um, it smells like it, just looking at these patients. It smells like it's basically really bad atelectasis that's not getting better with the incentive spirometer, guys. That's what it smells like to me. And I am a little bit late to the party with happy hypoxemics, but it's because, like, I'm seeing a lot of bad things happen, right? And that's why I wanted to talk about it. I'm really avoiding talking about COVID in general because I think that there's a lack of peer review. But going back to your decision of when to intubate. So if you're going to wait at this point between, say, a set of 100 and let's say 88, 86 even, your ability to go back up to a SAT of 100 after you intubate is a lot quicker. You require less oxygen delivery. Once you're in this zone, the oxygen dissociation curves gradient sort of flattens, sort of requires a higher uptick, a higher change in the PO2 and transition. And then when you're in this zone, all bets are off, right? If your PO2 is less than 40, or if your saturation is less than 60%, Good luck making that normal without some aggressive maneuvers, right? It's just infinitely harder. So when somebody tells me 80% mortality occurs when they take a patient, slap a fentanyl patch on them or give them Presidex, lower their rate of breathing, make them sleep on their bellies, wait for them to desaturate down to 60, and then try and intubate them, and that's they're having an 80% mortality rate, you know, I'm not surprised that they are. It's not the ventilator that's killing them. All due respect to everybody, it's, it's a, a lack of ability to differentiate between somebody who's a happy hypoxemic and somebody who's an unhappy, dying, respiratory failure patient. And there are two different things. This is an anecdotal statement. This whole talk is completely anecdotal. And it's just as bad or just as good as everything else on the internet right now. 
right? In my opinion, uh, COVID literature needs completely to be peer-reviewed all over again. We're getting a lot of sporadic uh, non-peer-reviewed preliminary acceptance data that doesn't make sense to me. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on happy hypoxemics. Um, if you're not bored yet, you can subscribe using YouTube, uh, Instagram, uh, iTunes, etc. Um, this is Saad al -Zaid. Thank you for listening. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Please leave some comments. Your comments are always um, respected, well-received, good or bad. Criticism is always a good thing.